Hey, John Reed, JDOD.com. Uh, one day after the mobility database event, we're picking up the pieces, see where we stand. I got Prakash Darcy with you. You were there yesterday. Yep. So Prakash is uh, an important person on the data warehousing side with SAP, with HANA, BW, IQ. Mm -hmm. what, what was your uh, sort of nutshell version of your experience yesterday? What kind of feedback did you get from people? Uh, the general sentiment, I think what I've heard is people were generally positive about the event overall. Uh, you know, people were basically saying, hey, it's about time that SAP has done this. Um, and bringing together the Sybase assets and the SAP assets will just lend a stronger presence in the overall market, whether it be SAP or non-SAP markets in the database industry. So I think the general announcement of combining the uh, engineering horsepower of Sybase and the long history of mission critical systems with the innovation center of HANA, I think is generally pretty well received. So IQ versus HANA, is, is IQ really gonna be an asset to what you're trying to do with HANA? Because I've heard a lot of people say IQ sort of is sort of like a good HANA for the mid-market, but you guys probably have a different vision of incorporating that, how does it work? So our integration phase is largely, we've got kind of a three-step roadmap for HANA and IQ. The first is actually integrating the assets. Second is kind of more optimizing the assets to work tighter together. Mm -hmm. And finally, synthesizing the assets to become more seamless over time. Right now, what does that mean really? Is, you know, Good people question. ask, yeah. Yeah, people ask like, hey, it, does that mean IQ is going away, right? And right. the answer I would say is no. And I, before we kind of get into the technology discussion, which I will, is we usually try to frame the top line market for data value. It's about data profile, mm. right? And the high value data profiles, what do you need in memory, right? Mm. Is a question about how valuable your data is. Mm. And what you need for not in memory, where you could take lower SLAs, makes sense to have in something that might be a disk-based architecture. So while we've got this innovation center around HANA, we view that the market from a data profiling standpoint mm -hmm. is actually somewhat complementary. And you might equate that to mid-market, like you said, or you might not. Right. Now, from an integrate standpoint, the first thing we're doing is we've got our business warehouse on top of HANA, mm -hmm. and the first step is we're actually enabling IQ to be near-line storage for BW. So when BW is on HANA, Right? You could say, data that's older than three years, do I really want that in memory? I want right. that for governance purposes, mm -hmm. but you can actually just tear that out to IQ. Right? Unified schema, unified management, et cetera. And it kind of the next step is actually doing that within the HANA engine natively for right. non-business warehouse use cases, right. where IQ becomes data tiering for BW. Right? Right. Right. Now, there's a stand, there is a market of IQ customers today in FSI, where they're using IQ as their data warehouse today pretty effectively. IQ right. is a pioneer in columnar. And in that market, a lot of folks are looking at HANA as analytical data marts on top of their data warehouse for a flexible line of business mm -hmm. and agile data marts. Right. And okay. just streamlining a lot of that. So when I read Haas's book about in memory, uh, he talked about the convergence of OLTP and OLAP. And my first thought was, well, data warehouses might go away in that vision. You're a data warehousing guy in a, in a HANA world. Is, is data warehousing going to go away? or? So I like to think about data warehouse in a very simple two-use case framework. One I would call is the reason people built data warehouses in one regard was for operational analytics. Right. I want to take the load off my transactional system. Right. And once I can do merge transactions and analysis, um, why have that data warehouse use case? Right. But there are, are other data warehouse use cases outside of operational analytics. Okay. One would be data consolidation. I want to look at finance and sales together. The structures of finance and sales aren't the same, right? So you actually do need to combine merge joint data. Now, could you do that in a new way with HANA? Absolutely. But the concept of a data warehouse doesn't go away. Mm. Now, the, lot, the physical implementation of it gets very different with the HANA world, meaning that you can do operational analytics on the transactional workload system, so why do those in a separate data warehouse? That data warehouse use case of operational analytics could be done on the transactional system. Mm -hmm. But the second use case around you want to merge and transform your data, and some of that data comes from 
non-SAP systems or big data systems like Hadoop worlds or those types of things, right. right? You can actually use that in your consolidated transactional landscape, but the concept of what you do is still the same concept of data warehousing over time, mm. right? Which is, I want to go ahead and merge semantics of different sets of information to solve business problems, and those structures and those problems I solve aren't tied to the way a table stored in a transaction mm -hmm. system. So HANA doesn't destroy data warehousing in your opinion then? No, not yeah. conceptually. It right. changes data warehousing from an implementation standpoint. Mm -hmm. But the idea of data warehousing will continue to be around. So when we look ahead to this vision of becoming more of a factor in the database market, what are the, what's, what are the obstacles, what are the challenges? Um, well, I, you know, I think the first one is it's a big market and where do we focus, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's a question of focus because the technology is innovative enough where we can go after a variety of markets. I could say our first place we want to take HANA to is to replace Oracle underneath SAP or our first place we want to go after is the predictive market and SaaS, right? We could go any direction with it. And the question is, what is the priority? So from, a, from the challenges in the marketplace, it's how do we pragmatically approach different markets? And the way we're doing that is we first said, look, we want to approach this timeless software we, where we start with the innovation without disruption. And we looked at it in two segments. What do we do in the net new segment, which is the non-SAP segment? And what do we do in the SAP segment? Mm -hmm. Right? And the SAP segment, we said, look, Customers with the suite can do HANA side-by-side -side operational analytics today. It's right. one of those data warehouse use cases we talked about. And they can do data warehouse use cases with business warehouse on HANA. Mm -hmm. And they can actually expand to multiple kind of, you know, aged information with HANA and IQ, or use IQ for more big data kind of landscapes, mm -hmm. right? So we started kind of that with the SAP path. Now in the standalone analytics market, right, we had business objects that was the number one BI vendor on a lot of third-party databases. Whether it's Oracle, SQL Server, DB2, doesn't matter. It was out there for that segment. When we go ahead and say, what do we want to do in the analytics space, that's more non-SAP transactional, right. more open market. And in that space, we've actually went ahead and introduced packaged analytics in that space. One of which, with a partner of ours, is Rapid Decisions, where they built JDE and PeopleSoft-based analytics as the data models for those transactional systems. And that's available today. Mm -hmm. What do you think customers want to hear from you guys at Sapphire about this? It can get a little confusing with all the different directions with databases and where to go next versus long term. What, what do you think customers want to hear at Sapphire? I think there's two major things that keep coming up. One is suite on HANA coming. Um, and the business suite, not the just business. ERP, yeah, correct. which you did announce. The ERP's been announced for the end of the year, but the business suite, okay, right. so that's one. So that's one, and the second one is, from a database standpoint, right, we don't want to go into a customer and say, our solution to your problem is a multi-database solution, right? Mm -hmm. So what are the use cases around when and why I use different databases, right? right? And Because SAP has a broad database portfolio at this point. Mm -hmm. And there's certain data profiles for ASC, IQ, and HANA. Right. And it's those data profiles that customers are looking to understand. Right. Right. So when, why would I use one versus the other with a suite? Right. And in that suite use case, I'll give you an example of those data profiling. Um, for suite on HANA, one value prop is that you go ahead and have a consolidated landscape with all of your data in memory. Right. right? For transactions and analytics. Right. But today, if you put Suite on ASE and you put HANA side by side, you get the same business value prop. Right. Right? Yep. And largely you would get a similar value prop, you just don't have it on a consolidated landscape. Right. And then you decide, you know, do I want to put my Suite on ASE and HANA side by side, or do I want to consolidate the landscape? Those are, that, it's a customer choice. Right. And the data profile really depends on what do you want to get with merged OLTP and OLAP, mm -hmm. right? And that really comes down to what is the value of your data and how you want to make sense of that data. And what about pricing? So what do customers want to know there? I think everyone's asking for transparency in pricing. I think yesterday at the database conference, we actually went ahead and talked about you know, the pricing schedule, how we price, what the metrics are, 
what the markets are. We did see that for HANA, actually, you did disclose some pricing around how you yeah. build HANA. You gonna do the same thing with IQ and that kind of stuff? Um, we, uh, we will look at that. <laughs> so, like, here's, here's kind of the short version. With HANA, it's easy because it's non discountable. Right, right. ASE and IQ are discountable. So, All what? Right, here we go. So what's your price, right? right? <laughs> well, we can give you a list price, but the net right. price is kind of what customers have different arrangements with SAP, et cetera. So from a, I can tell you the price right now, it's price per core. Right. ASE and IQ are priced by core, right. Right? right? And we basically say, this is the price per core, this is the gross value, and then we have certain customer arrangements in different regions, but they're discountable yeah. products, right? So it really comes down to our agreements with our customers. All I know is that I'd be blown away at Sapphire if you guys could show uh, comparisons between the products and also some pricing information around it. It would be that'd be a whole new SAP around pricing and database. Yeah. Maybe soon. Maybe not a Sapphire, but maybe yeah, soon. Like, like, look, we do want to get transparent on yeah. it, right? And I think part of the reason with Hana and kind of the schedule and what we've talked about in terms of disclosing a lot of the price points was to get more transparent because right. we can. Because look, right. instead of saying, look, we're going to negotiate a lot of these things, which is the way we've kind of traditionally right. done business, if we say it's not discountable and here's our fixed price per tier where it's just kind of a fixed dis fixed redu reduction in tier that's effectively like a discount right. right but we're just transparent around what that schedule is right if like i think sap would be better off moving to that type of mod mantra over time because then it Absolutely. just becomes more transparent right now yeah it's one of those you know rome wasn't built in a day type things as well right so yeah. as we look at uh, it's easy to do with new things like hana yeah but with things that have a long installed base and contracts with customers and that yeah. type of stuff, we have to make sure we don't disrupt our customers, right? This right. timeless innovation isn't just about products, but it's about you know, the agreements and the trust you have with the company. If we've created a contract and we've created kind of a certain pricing model with you, we want to honor that forward, right? Which just kind of makes it one of those, you know, uh, you know a buddy of mine told me once that you know, God, uh, God couldn't have built the world in seven days with an install base. And it just kind of sticks with me, right? Mm -hmm. Is we've got this install base and we need to make sure, first and foremost, that as we introduce new innovation, we do it in a non-disruptive way. Negotiation versus transparency, SAP's pricing dilemma. Yeah, it is, right? And yeah. I, I think yeah. it's, it's one of those areas that we will look to get more transparent as we can. All right, well that's right. my vote, we'll see. To be continued at Sapphire. Yeah. Thanks for joining us today and sharing some insights. Okay, thanks. Appreciate it.